Appreciate it. So this week and this month, we will be focusing on the Advent as told through the eyes of Luke. The author Luke, in your Bible, he wrote his own gospel and his own account of the life of Jesus. And you may not realize this, but it's only Luke and Matthew that talk about the birth of Jesus uh, out of the four gospels. And Luke has quite a bit to say, and I wanted to start kind of with an opening sermon asking the question, why did he even come? Have you even thought about that question? We tell the story so much and every Christmas rolls around and there's all sorts of cute phrases and movies and all this kind of stuff that comes with, with Christmas time. And, and those of us that are Christian like to remind people that Jesus is the reason for the season. And that's great. But do we ever stop to think, but why is there a Christmas? Why did he come at all? When and where did he make that decision that this is how he was going to solve the sin problem? This is how he was going to deal with planted earth. And the Bible kind of indicates that he had this plan in mind even before he created Adam and Eve even before our world came into existence, that he had this in mind. So somewhere back in eternity, and I don't know if the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit sat around a little round table where they make all their important decisions, and I don't know if they you know, make a motion and second it, or, or how it all works for them, but, but somewhere there must have been a conversation where they said, you know what we're going to do if our creatures rebel? You know what we're going to do if they decide not to follow us? If they decide that love isn't the best way? If they decide they want to do it their way? Well, if it was you and I, I think the answer would be very easy. It'd be like, oh yeah, they are going to rebel. Well, guess who has all the power? It's me. So, bye-bye. That's what I would have done. <clears throat> if Lucifer started to rebel, Lucifer's gone. Somebody else starts to rebel, they're gone. <laughs> uh, and then I'll be like, who's next? You want to rebel too? Okay, you can be gone. <laughs> I mean, like, this is easy, God. This is all you need to do. You got the power. You, can ta- you brought them into existence. You can take them out of existence. You have all remember the Bill Cosby quote about, I'm your father, I brought you into this world, and I can take you out of this world. (laughs) That's how we parent in this world. But God didn't see it that way. And I can't stand here and speak for God because his thoughts are not my thoughts and his ways are not my ways. But what I do know is that the plan he came up with, if you really think about it, is pretty mind-blowing. And it's kind of counterintuitive to how we would do things. And what's really mind-blowing about it, what really doesn't make sense if you're God, is that he would sacrifice himself for us. That he would give his life, that he would become human. Now that's really radical. And so as great as it is that he became human, as great as it is that he gave his life on the cross and all the things we talk about, I just want to pause for a moment this Christmas season and think about what was that moment when they made the decision that this is what they would do when it happened. Because that moment is pretty special. That's an incredible moment. We're going to make them in our image. We'll name them Adam and Eve. And then when they sin, I'm going to become a human I'm going to give my life. I'm going to walk in their shoes. I'm going to show them a better way. I'm going to teach them. And I'm going to die. I don't understand how that's the plan they came up with, but I'm very grateful for it. And in Luke chapter 1, we read the story of this plan coming into action. And and of course, it's amazing that not only they came up with it, but secondly, that they would go through with it. And it says that an angel appeared to Mary, and our children acted it out wonderfully here. And he said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. 
And the interesting thing about this, in the next verse, we didn't, I didn't put it on the screen, but the next verse says, and he will be called Son of the Most High. So you're going to have this son, but his father is going to be God. You will be the mother, God will be the father, half human, half divine, 100% human, 100% divine, however you want to say it, hard to comprehend, beyond our comprehension, but God becomes man. And he's going to come into this world as a baby. And he's going to grow up just like you and I have had to grow up. He's going to be in kindergarten just like our kindergarten class. He's going to reenact Bible stories just like our kindergarten class. He's going to learn and grow and walk. He's going to scrape his knee and cut his thumb and argue with some students maybe. I don't know. But he's going to become one of us and he's going to live our life. And what's interesting here is that the angel says to him, you're going to conceive, give birth to a son, and you are to call him what? Jesus. The angel tells her what to name him. Now, I don't know about you, but this is one of the most fun parts of being a parent. When you find out that you're going to have a child, assuming that you wanted that child. (laughs) Of course you did. Of course you did. And you're all excited about it. And then you go to the name book, right? It's like, hey, what are we going to name this kid? If it's a girl, what do you think? And you kind of, as you know, debate as parents, and maybe as a grandparent, you've had this with your kids, and they, hey, we're pregnant. Oh, great, what are we going to name? And maybe there's a discussion in the whole family about what to name if it's a boy and what to name if it's a girl. I remember specifically my brother with his second child. When they did the ultrasound at 20 weeks or whatever it was, and they found out it was going to be a boy, it was going to be the first boy among the grandchildren. I had two girls, and, so, and he had had a, a daughter for his first. So we had three girls in the family at this point. But the second one that he was going to have was going to be a boy. So there was some excitement. All right, we got a boy. Now we need a boy's name. Well, I didn't want to say anything because I didn't feel it was my place. But you know, the name Richard is a nice name. <coughs> means lion-hearted, powerful ruler. I mean, who wouldn't want the name Richard? It's a great name. A lot of great Richards have lived throughout, you know, the history. And I thought I had a, a chance. I thought I had a chance because my brother's wife's father was named Richard. So we got dad on one side, brother on the other side. I mean, if not for the first name, at least squeeze it in the middle and, you know, the kid can, you know... Say it's his middle name where you never use it, but it's there. They name their son Noah. I don't even know what his middle name is, but it's not Richard. (laughs) That's all I know. And I was so just surprised. And to this day, I still bring it up because why? When Richard was obvious choice for this guy... And they would have another girl after him, so it's just, he's the only one, like, that you can't name a girl Richard, that doesn't work. So they blew their opportunity. But when you're the parent, you have the privilege of choosing the name. Even if your brother or brother-in-law doesn't care for it, or even if the family says, no, we think you should use this name, you as the parent get to choose the name. And the name is special, and the name is something that you choose for a purpose and for a reason. And especially in this culture, a name meant so much. And it's interesting that God chooses the name for his son. And he says, you are to call him Jesus. And this, if you don't know, is actually a transliteration of the Hebrew. And the actual name in Hebrew is Joshua. We say Jesus because that's the Greek way to pronounce it. But in Hebrew, Yahshua. And, and Joshua was, of course, the name of the one who brought the Israelites into the promised land. He is the one that parted the, the river Jordan. He is the one that was there when the walls of Jericho fro- fell. He was the one that led Israel into their destiny that brought them into the promised land. And he says, this one that is coming, he is the real Joshua. He is the one that will take my people where I have wanted to bring them. He is the one that will bring them out of slavery and into this promised future and salvation and destiny that I have for them. And what you need to know is that the name Joshua means the Lord 
saves. The Lord saves. Because Jesus came to save his people. Well, the book of Luke continues. And remember, we don't read much about Jesus' childhood. I wish we knew more. I'm sure it would be fascinating. But when he begins his public ministry, which is here in Luke uh, chapter 4, you remember he was baptized. He went into the wilderness for 40 days. He was tempted by the devil. And he came back, it says, full of the Holy Spirit. And he begins his public ministry by going back to his hometown of Nazareth. And on Sabbath, it says, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue and he asked for the scroll of Isaiah. And this is how he announces himself. He reads from Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. And to set the oppressed free. This is why he came. And this is what Jesus tells us about his ministry. This is what Jesus tells us about his mission. I have come to proclaim the good news. I have come to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. I have come to give blind men sight. I have come to set the oppressed free. That is why I'm here. That is who I am. And you remember in the story, they don't like it, and they go, oh, you're Jesus, and don't we know your family, and what are you crazy? Like, that's the Messiah. But he's introducing himself as the Son of God, as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the Yahshua who had come to save. Because that is why he came. And we read this scripture, and I think we think, oh, it's so beautiful, you know, it's so nice that he had this mission, and, and look, he's going to help those people that need help. He's going to help the poor, he's going to, you know, help those that are in prison, he's going to help those that are blind, and we remember that when he was on earth, he actually did that kind of thing, and he, he healed people who were literally blind, and, and we think, oh, it's so nice that he was so generous, and he, he, took, he took into account those that were less fortunate, In fact, look at the words that are here. He helped the poor, the prisoners, the blind, the oppressed. And it kind of gives us a warm, fuzzy feeling. You know, isn't it nice that God would reach out to these people? But the danger is that we believe that those people are other people. Because we are the poor. We are the prisoners. We are the blind. We are the oppressed. And if you don't believe me, God said this, and later in the book of Revelation, he says specifically to those living before his second advent of whom we believe we are part of that group. He said, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. And the danger is that we look out in the world and we say, you know, it's a shame that the world is this way. It's a shame there are these hurting people and these people making bad decisions and people that are addicted to this and people that are struggling with that. Isn't it nice that Jesus loves them too? Isn't it nice that Jesus helps them? I'm glad that I'm not like that. For you say, I do not need a thing. The verse continues. But you do not realize. You do not realize that you are what? Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You don't know it. You don't know it. You don't see it. You don't realize it. I came for you. You see, I need a Savior. And you need a Savior. And no matter how long you've been walking with God, or whether you were born in the church, whether your dad was some church official, or your mom did all this stuff, whatever it is, you still need a Savior. Because you were born wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, Naked. And isn't it interesting how this list is so similar with the list in the mission of Jesus? And this was a problem for the first Advent people of God. 
We don't have to get far in Jesus' ministry before we read this story. And you remember that Jesus had invited one of the tax collectors to be one of his disciples. And people were talking, and, and this guy, Levi, throws this banquet for Jesus. And, and he eats with the tax collectors and the sinners and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. By the way, that's the good people. That's the church people. They look around and they say, wait, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? If you were a man of God, you are hanging out with the wrong crowd. If you knew who these people were, if you knew what they do, if you knew how they think, these are bad people. You are with the wrong group. And Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, in parentheses, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. That's why I'm with them. That's why I'm, I'm fellowshipping and I'm eating with the tax collectors. That's why I'm with the sinners. That's why I let prostitutes come to me. That's why I bless the children. It's the people that need me that I have come for. If you think you're righteous and you do not need a thing, then I guess I haven't come for you. Because what can I do for you if you do not want the help? If you do not see your need? In fact, one of the greatest messages of the Advent story is a reminder that we needed a Savior. We live in a culture and a time where we think we are wealthy, we think we are blessed, we think we have it, we think we can fix it, we think we can microwave it, we think we can have an expert to do it. And we have people that are experts in everything in this world that we live in today. Oh, you're having this problem, well, just go see this. I mean, I have never seen so many different types of doctors I mean, like 50 years ago, it was just one doctor, right? You went to see the doctor. And now, what do you, oh no, this doctor is going to send you to this doctor who's going to send you to this doctor. And oh, don't you know they specialize in exactly your type of whatever? So you can go see the expert at this hospital in this university with this specialist who's written the book and done the research. But what we forget is that there's one doctor who can solve your basic, most deep and core need. There's one doctor who came to take away your sin, to bring you salvation, to open your eyes, to break your chain to deliver you from the oppression of this world, of the enemy, of Satan, of sin, of all the things that happen in this sinful planet that bring us down, that destroy us. And he has come, and if you will recognize him, he has come for you, and he will save you, because that's who he is, and that's what he does. I think there's some similarities between the time when Jesus came the first time and when he'll come back the second time. And as I was studying this passage, the Lord just so powerfully put it on my heart that there's a danger that we might also be like those early Pharisees and teachers of the law. That we might become confident in our own righteousness. That we might think we know the answers. That we might view the world as those who just don't get it and don't know and we're the ones that have it together. If anyone had it together, it was Jesus Christ, but he still loved the weak. He still sought after those who were hurting. He still had compassion on those who were just making mistakes left and right. I remember Brendan Manning in his book, The Ragamuffin Gospel, he said when he was a young pastor, he was visiting a woman who had requested Bible studies, and he's sharing with her, and he begins to learn her story, and she has like a four-year-old uh, little girl who's running around the house as they're talking, and she says, you know, I'm really ashamed about my past. I said, okay, and she said, when I was a teenager, I got up with the wrong people and I was forced into sex 
trafficking and sex work, and I was a prostitute. She said, matter of fact, it's because of that that I became pregnant. And when I became pregnant, the people I was working for told me I had to have an abortion. And she said, something in me just couldn't do it because there was a life inside of me. And she said, I decided that I would just have to run away and escape because they were going to make me have this abortion. And so I ran away and I went to another city and found a job there and in a restaurant, waiting tables, and I had the baby and I was really happy that I saved the baby's life and didn't realize at the time that the baby had also saved mine. And then I got to know Jesus and I wanted to learn more and she said, but here I am, I'm trying to make it work and I'm a single mom and I have this terrible past. And Brennan shared with her, it's okay, God loves you. God has forgiven you. He can restore everything that was taken from you. And she's like, oh, you know, he could just see her melting as he explained the love of God that the Bible tells us about and who Jesus is and how Jesus welcomed people of all backgrounds and pasts. And after he had made this appeal, he was feeling so good about how everything was going. He said to her, he said, well, why don't you come to my church next, next weekend? And she stopped and she looked at him and she goes, why would I ever go to church? He says, oh no, we have a nice church. We'd love to have you come. And she's like, oh no. Church is the last place I'm going to go. What will they say about me there? And Brennan said it broke his heart. And it broke his heart partly because he, when he thought about it, he was worried what some people might say when they knew her story. And he knew he couldn't guarantee that if she came to church, she would find the love of God and the acceptance and the deliverance that she was looking for. And he knew that many churches are a little bit judgmental and condescending. And he understood that her reaction was probably what a lot of people in our world think. Why in the world would I go to church to be judged, to be told I'm not good enough when my life has been a disaster, why would I go to church where all these people have it together? They're doing the right thing and I did the wrong thing. And why would I want to be with them? And Jesus says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor. Church is not a place where you go because you got it all together. Church is not a place you go because you are living perfectly and doing everything right. Jesus is not saying, I only want those who are clean, only those who are worthy, only those who are living perfectly and rightly and good and righteous. He says, it is the sick who need a doctor, and I have come for them. I think there's a lesson for us as a church in the ministry of Jesus. There's a lesson of those of in, in the life of Jesus for those of us that are waiting for his second advent. Because the thing that's so amazing to me about Jesus is that even though he was perfect, even though he did not do any sin, anything that was wrong, people who were sinners, people who were struggling, people who were trying to find a way wanted to be around him. And that blows my mind. I don't usually like being around people that are better at things than me. Right? Like, if, the, if someone's a little too good at something, she's like, ah, oh, I think I'll find another friend. Like their life is, they just always have it together. It always works out for them. They're always getting promoted. They're always, like she's the perfect mom and she bakes 20 cookies while she's doing this and that and driving. Oh, I think I'll find someone else. Why weren't sinners uncomfortable around Jesus? Because he wasn't a sinner. He was perfect. We don't like being around those kind of people. But there's something about Jesus. The Pharisees felt uncomfortable around him. But the prostitutes would come. 
The teachers of the law felt uncomfortable around him, but the tax collectors saw hope. The church people felt uncomfortable around him, but the Gentiles flocked to him. It's fascinating to me. I think maybe our principle of evangelism could be summed up in this phrase. You've probably heard it before. How do we witness? How do we lead people to Christ? When we realize that I'm just one beggar showing another beggar where to get bread. Maybe you need to write this down, what I'm about to say. We cannot touch other people with the gospel until we have been touched ourselves. Until we see our need of Jesus and how he meets that need, we will not be able to help those who are in need. Until we taste of the bread, we cannot tell them how good it is. Until we find the bread, we cannot tell them where it is. And this is good bread, folks. This is whole grain, hearty, lots of fiber, even some protein. This will give you energy. It will sustain you. It will strengthen you. We have something to offer this world. Where was Jesus born? You know this one. This is an easy question, not a trick question. Where was he born? What city? Bethlehem. Very good. We'll, we'll do more quiz questions later. That was the easy one. In the town of Bethlehem, which means house of bread. House of bread. That's where he was born. That's why he would later stand up and say, I am the bread of life. If you are hungry, I am here. If you have a need, I can satisfy. Everything you're looking for is right here. I have come. I have left heaven. I am here to meet the needs that you have. But you have to come to me. You have to realize you need me. And so as a church, I ask us, do we see our need of God? I remember another time later in his ministry when Jesus would say, I am the vine and you are the branches. Remember that? And what's striking about that is he said, if the branch is disconnected from the vine, it can do nothing. It just withers and dies. And then he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. We need him. You say, but, oh, but Rick, we can do so much. I mean, I can do. He's given us free choice. And look at all these things. Oh, yeah, we've done a lot. We've done a lot of damage. At some point, we have to wake up and say, you know, I think I need him. Some of us are here right now today because we started to get it. The damage had built up. The hurt had built up. The pain has built up. The wounds have built up. And we're like, maybe I should try a different. Maybe I should get a little help. Maybe I need to look into this Jesus thing because my life is not working. Things are not going as I hoped. You're in the right place. And it's my prayer that the only Seventh-day Adventist church can be that place where we can show people where to get the bread. Not because we made it, not because we bought it or we had some secret knowledge or we were better than them, but because we stumbled on it in His grace. No, better than that, because He found us when we were lost and trying to find our way in life. Luke chapter 19, as we go further in His ministry, Jesus just said it so simply and so succinctly. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. All boiled down this. The great commission that he would give to his disciples is this in a nutshell. It's the same mission. To seek and to save the lost. Go ye into all the world. You remember that? That's seeking. And I want to apply it to our church today because 
if we don't take this mission seriously, then the devil will make sure we have a lot of counterfeit missions running. And it's so easy for us as humans to get distracted. It's so easy for us to get caught up in thinking, well, church is this, church is that, church is this, and we hear, why are we here? We're here for the same reason Jesus came, to seek and to save the lost. We found salvation, now it's our turn to help others find salvation. We found hope, it's our turn to extend that hope to those outside these walls. Those outside our windows, those that are hungry, those that are hurting. For we at the only Seventh-day Adventist church have the same mission. For if we follow Jesus, then we will be seeking and saving the lost. And I love this summary that Ellen White gives in the book Ministry of Healing, page 143. Nobody in my, all my reading and all my research summarizes the ministry of Jesus better than this, this sentence, two sentences. And I just put the, this is me that put the numbers up there just to break it down because it's so beautifully articulated. And right before this, she says, Christ's method alone will bring success in winning people to God. His method alone, no other methods. How did he do it? Well, we've already read how he did it, but here's how she summarized it, and I think it's beautiful. She said, the Savior, Savior, remember, he saves, this is who he is. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. Don't you love being around people who desire your good? Sure. And the opposite Don't you hate being around people who have an agenda for you? Who desire something good for them out of you? (laughs) I remember once I came out of a grocery store years ago, and this woman came and just made a beeline right for me. And so I was looking at her and being a pastor, my first thought is always, which member is this? It's really unfair. You guys have to learn one name. I have to learn like a million. It's, It's really a challenge. So she's coming towards me, and I'm looking at her face. Okay, was she a visitor this week? She clearly seems to know me. She's coming right for me. I'm trying to think who she is. And before I can even kind of figure that out, she, she reaches out with a little pamphlet and she says, do you believe we're living in the last days? Ah, now I know who she is. And you know who she is. <laughs> and good for them. We all know who they are because they're out there doing this. And she puts the pamphlet in front of me. She says, you know, we're... and I was just about to answer. And I was kind of happy to answer because I'm all about this. Like, hey, I've got a degree in this. This will be a great conversation. You've asked me about the last days. Let me tell you, sister, about Revelation and Daniel and all the prophecies and 2,300 days. I mean, we could go a long way today in the parking lot. So I'm all ready for this. And right as I'm about to answer, she launches into what was obviously a memorized speech. And I don't remember exactly what she said, but it was something along the lines of, we are living in the last days, and there's a prophet for these last days, and he has a book for this last days, and you need to read it, and I'm here, this this little pamphlet will tell you all about it, and if you will do that, and if you will repent, you can be saved, and you can be saved when Jesus comes quick, and you need to do it now. And she finished it. And by the time she finishes her speech, I went from feeling like a religious expert to feeling like, wow, she really thinks I'm lost. <laughs> and I felt my blood pressure start to rise. Because if anybody's not lost, it's the pastor. But she doesn't even know. And I haven't even had a chance to tell her who I am and how an expert I am in being saved and not lost and all of this. So I'm starting to formulate my response. I'm starting to formulate what I want to say. I'm feeling myself getting a little angry because she's talking down to me and she's implying that I need to get my life together and all of this. And right when she finishes and I'm about to reply, she walks away. (laughs) And quickly. And scans the parking lot for the next person who's going to get her speech and her next brochure. And I stood there a little bit stunned and taken aback because I never got to discuss any of the issues she raised with me. 
and I never got to let her know what I knew and have a little counter back and forth and figure, you know, maybe I can teach her a thing or two. And I walked to my car, and I got in the car, and I realized as I drove away that I was angry. And I was frustrated. I was like, man, you know, that was really... And then I started thinking, man, that denomination, the way they do things, that's terrible. Until all of a sudden, in my little pity party and anger, a voice goes in my head. That's how other people feel when you witness to them, Rick. And the light bulb went off, and the mirror was put in front of me, the spiritual mirror, and suddenly I felt terrible because I knew God was right. Because I knew there were times when I had been a know-it-all. I had told someone exactly what they should do and how to get their life together and da-da-da-da. And I had looked down on them and I had walked away thinking I had just witnessed for God. I was such a good person. And I could check that off my list for the day. I knew that I had driven to people's homes and given them Bible studies and told them how their beliefs were wrong and my were right and walked away thinking I've done such a good deed today and may have left them sitting there angry. But I never thought about them because I didn't desire their good. I was trying to check off my list. I was trying to be a good Christian. I was trying to do my evangelism. I was trying to win souls from my church so that my membership would go up. And that's why people didn't like being around the Pharisees, but they loved being around Jesus. Because Jesus desired their good. Now, did Jesus still give them a Bible study? I'm sure. Did Jesus still tell them about God? I'm sure. But he did it from a place of love, grace, compassion. He did it because he truly desired their good. And then he expressed it. He showed his sympathy for them. Don't you love being around sympathetic people, empathetic people? I started a podcast this week. The podcast title is Finding Fred. Any guess what Fred we're talking about? I'll give you a hint. They just made a movie, and Tom Hanks was Fred. It's Fred Rogers. So a friend of mine just texted me the other, this week and said, oh, there's this cool podcast, Finding Fred. I think you'd like it. He knows that Fred Rogers is one of my heroes. I grew up with Fred. Like, my parents would not let me watch anything fun. So I got the Presbyterian minister and his neighborhood and his puppets. But that guy was amazing. And if you watched Mr. Rogers, he made you feel special. He made you feel loved. I don't know how he did it through a screen. Like when Mr. Rogers talked to you through that camera, you thought he was talking just to you. He just had that gift. And it's no secret and it's no mystery that he was a minister of the gospel. And he understood Jesus' mission. And he had that mission. And Mr. Rogers reasoned this way. He said, if I can get them when they're kids. Right, teachers? If I can get them when they're kids, then I can fix a lot of adult problems. By the time we're adults, we're a lot harder to fix. We're a lot more broken, a lot more messy, and a lot more stuck in our ways, and a lot more stubborn, and a lot more. And Mr. Rogers knew if I can can take a whole generation and teach them to be empathetic, and teach them they're loved, and teach them their value, and teach them how to handle their feelings and their emotions. I was listening to this podcast, and I was listening, and they play excerpts from his show, and I was just struck by how amazingly Christ-like he was. You know what? And he didn't have to give a huge Bible study. He didn't have to teach them about the prophecies and why this does this. And there's not that there's anything wrong with that. But he lived the love of God. And every person who watches that show, and you can go watch them now, will feel it in his voice, in his eyes, in what he did, in what he said. He showed his sympathy, he ministered to their needs. And then, what is natural, number four here, is he won their confidence. Because that's a person you can trust. 
someone who has your best interest at heart, someone who will do something about it, someone who will help meet your needs and, and help you when you need help. Those are the friends you can count on. Those are the people you trust, and those are the people that you thank God when they enter your life. You can be that person to someone else. And it's only after those four steps that it says he bade them follow me. Too often we start with step five. You should follow Jesus. Don't you know Jesus? Do you read your Bible? You know better than this. God cannot accept that behavior. We have no right to tell people to follow God until we've lived and showed them his love for them. Until we've done these four steps, we have no right to ask them to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, in our case, we're not asking them to follow us. Please don't ask them to follow us. Because <laughs> I'm just human, you're just human. You're going to let them down. We're going to mess up. And that's why we're just one beggar, beggar telling another beggar where we found the bread where they can get it. And the bread of life has come. He was born in the house of bread. He is the bread. He is the nourishment that our world needs. And we can share with that world where they can find it. But we have to do it in his mission. We have to do it in his way. And we have to do it because we have had an encounter with him. And we know at least a little bit of what we speak. I think a church that catches that vision, I think a church that commits to that mission will do great things in this world and make a huge difference. Mr. Rogers died years ago. And I don't think he could have ever comprehended that they would make a podcast about him, that Tom Hanks would play Mr. Rogers in a movie. There's nothing even dramatic about him. How do you make a movie about one of the quietest, simplest people that have ever walked this planet. But his life was so profound and it touched so many people that they wanted to make a movie because they felt his message is needed now more than ever. Because somehow we've forgotten what he taught us as children. We've got distracted by all the other missions, all the other agendas, all the other priorities. As we journey through the book of Luke this holiday season, I hope we can recapture who Jesus is, who recapture why he came, and then we can be part of this mission because he is inviting you and I to join him in the mission that he had to seek and to save the lost. Amen.